Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, welcome to the fifth in the scheduled series of talks, um, Works in Progress, Construction History in New York and Chicago. We're looking at New York tonight with uh, a special case study by Alexander Wood of the Will Mills Building, uh, building the financial district in New York by George B. Post of, uh, eight, of the eight, early 1800s, 1882. We um, will spend uh, time tonight looking in depth at various aspects of the design, con uh, construction, development, construction of this building. And in future topics, we'll connect this to the earlier parts of the series, which um, I hope all of you uh, have been with us uh, to experience or have seen on our website. Indeed, we are going to send a survey around to the about 450 people who have signed up um, individually for one of these, or at least one of these lectures, um, and ask you to comment on the series, uh, ask you to pose questions or make suggestions for future topics that we might explore, because we are really just at the beginning of this great uh, kind of unexplored academic territory that needs so much more work and attention in order to understand the construction history, but also the place of construction in uh, the building of buildings, the building culture of cities, uh, and the, um, the, the development of American cities as we've looked at the two key ones uh, in New York and Chicago in the 19th century. So this talk being the fifth in a series is not going, it's not the last because we want to have a kind of round uh, table discussion that will bring in especially Tom Leslie uh, and Don Friedman who um, won't be with us tonight. Sorry, here we are looking at the four of the topics where they featured their paired talks on New York and Chicago with foundations, frames, uh, facades, and fire in order to have a full complement of six hours of talking about uh, these, these various aspects, um, formative aspects of the building in these, uh, in these two key cities. Uh, during that time of the six hours of, of focus, I think um, we all agree that the, that the subject got much more complicated rather than clearer. And in the round table, where we'll bring in the voices of the other moderators and the questions that you bring to, uh, to the table um, and to the discussion, hopefully tonight and in emails uh, to the Skyscraper Museum for the follow-up, we want to um, engage in a, a kind of a summary, a comparisons, uh, thoughts on the more meta narrative that may have developed after we have some time to digest these various talks. And so you do have time to see to catch up with the series if you haven't seen it on our website or on our YouTube channel. Uh, and sometime in June, probably on June 21st, we'll have this roundup session and we'll be sure to let everyone um, who's attended these uh, various talks uh, and everyone on our uh, e-blast and on our social media to know when that is. So we really invite you to participate and also to offer your ideas about where we go next in this kind of endlessly fascinating subject. We might even go to other cities besides um, New York and Chicago, or we might go to other decades um, beyond the 1930s, and we tiptoed into the post-war period with Tom Leslie in Chicago last week. Um, but now we're going back to the earliest decades of high-rise construction in New York City. So the invention of the technologies, but also the, um, the introduction of a, of, a, of a true need in order to capitalize on the land in multi-story office buildings. And Alexander Wood is going to lead us um, on this investigation because this is a subject that he has explored in his dissertation that he finished in 2020 uh, at Columbia in the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, and that where the title of his dissertation is uh, Building the Metropolis, Architecture, Building and Labor in New York City, 1890 um, to, not, to 1935. Um, Alex has been um, teaching uh, in at various schools, uh, including at, at GSAP. He is trained as an architect, uh, first 
at Cooper Union, uh, then at MIT, where he got an MArch, uh, and then, as I said, in, in um, theory and history um, at GSAP. So uh, he has been delving into the archives, which he continues to do as he now turns his dissertation into a book um, in a research phase to bring this all together and to bring the writing together um, as a fellow at the New York Historical Society, where he's going to speak um, to us uh, from tonight. And uh, after I show you the, I guess the next slide in this, um, in our series here, uh, to mention um, some of his other publications that you can find through a digital search easily. This one happens um, to emphasize the, uh, the Dakota apartment house uh, and the strike, the labor strike around that. And so mentions or raises the issue of, of labor, which is one of the key aspects um, that he is bringing to uh, his digestion of this 19th century history. So, um, uh, let me invite Alex to come back onto the screen as I get off, and I will um, ask people if you have questions to post them in the chat, and we will try to comb those out um, during his presentation so that uh, after Alex speaks, um, he and I will uh, have, uh, you know, converse, uh, and I can introduce some of your questions into the discussion as well. So, um, Alex, as I turn, as I uh, stop my share and allow you to do yours and stop my camera, um, here is Alexander Wood um, to tell us about the Mills Building. Hi. Um, thank you, Carol, and thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be talking about skyscraper construction in New York in the early 1880s. Um, and in particular, I'm going to be talking about an important uh, skyscraper, the Mills Building, which was completed in 1882. Uh, in order to explore further some of the topics and themes that uh, Tom and Don discussed in some of the earlier lectures, uh, but also to talk about the broader landscape of the building industry uh, at a particular moment in time in the early 1880s. Uh, I generally believe that history is the study of change, of change and conflict, but there is value, um, as I hope to show, in sort of taking a cross section of uh, the New York building industry at a very um, special moment uh, in time. In the spring of 1882, the 10-story Mills Building was completed in Lower Manhattan at the corner of Broad Street and Exchange Place across from the New York Stock Exchange. At the time, it was the largest, most expensive and luxurious office building ever erected in the city. Built for the California banker, Darius Ogden Mills, designed by the architect George B. Post and erected by the general contractor, David H. King Jr. The Mills Building set a new standard by which other tall office buildings were judged in the city for more than a decade. Remarkably, given its location, the building continued to command high rents long after it was superseded by newer office buildings until it was finally torn down in 1925, after which it was replaced by the much larger Equitable Trust Building, also known as 15 Broad Street. Like many other tall office buildings built in New York or in Chicago in the 1880s, the Mills Building was built specifically as a speculative office building, meaning it was designed as a rental property in which all of the office space that it contained was rented on the open market. More specifically, however, the Mills Building was erected to provide office space to the growing number of capitalists, bankers, stockbrokers, and railroad corporations that were making New York City their home in the early 1880s. In this picture from 1882, for example, which has Cornelius Vanderbilt in the painting overlooking the so-called Kings of Wall Street, you can see Darius Ogden Mills himself leaning on the mantle. He's the building owner. All the way to the left is Cyrus W. Field, a financier that helped uh, finance the first transatlantic cable 
He was also on the uh, rent roll of the Mills building. Some of the other tenants uh, when the building first opened included Collis P. Huntington, one of Darius Ogden Mills friends from California and one of the so-called big four, Henry Villard, another railroad speculator, along with Clinton B. Fisk. Uh, the Mills building in particular was attractive to, as the New York office of about half a dozen major railroads including the Northern Pacific, the Central Pacific, the St. Louis and San Francisco Railway, the Ontario and Western, Vanderbilt's West Shore and Buffalo Line, also the Oregon Railroad and Navigation Company, uh, which helped uh, settle and develop a lot of the state of Oregon. It was also the location of the New York office of the Pullman Palace Car Company. So what was it about the Mills building that made it so attractive uh, to, to all of these capitalists and railroads? Well, for one, it offered security, privacy, and luxury. Three different things that I think are expressed in this incredible uh, iron gateway at the entrance to the Mills building on Broad Street. Uh, when the building existed, armed guards were actually stationed outside of this gateway, which would be raised each morning and lowered each evening. Uh, there were watchmen on every floor, um, essentially to provide interference from people that would come to the building in order to um, offer, excuse me, in order to get the time of all of these financiers. Uh, and there were also staff stationed upstairs to prevent people from coming to the enormous French restaurant that was on the 10th floor, which I think was also another amenity that attracted all of these capitalists. Um, you can see here the 10th floor is actually, you can see those circular windows this 10th floor restaurant, which was limited to tenants and their guests only, had these windows that looked like portholes looking out over the city. After the completion of the Mills building, it was almost a new genre of um, gossip column that you can find, for example, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, in which they would send up financial reporters to, for example, listen in or have conversations with these different bankers and railroad directors uh, talking about financial news. Uh, so this 10th floor restaurant was also somewhat unusual. It was the first one in an office building in New York. Now, more important than the gateway or the 10th floor restaurant was simply the fact that the Mills building was much more modern, uh, was much more attractive as an, as an office space uh, than most of the older office buildings in the financial district at the time. As you can see from this uh, ground floor plan of the eighth floor, George B. Post, the architect of the building, designed the office building around this central light court that opened out onto Broad Street, enabling all of the offices, uh, even the offices that looked into the interior of the court to have excellent natural light, which was typically one of the primary determinants of the uh, quality or value of office space in New York, the quality of light. So this natural light was supplemented by gas lighting fixtures, but the Mills building was also the first office building in the city built with uh, electric lighting, which was installed by the Edison Illumination Company and the building featured its own electric generating plant in the basement. Interestingly, some of the only interior pictures that we have of the Mills building are these uh, sort of portraits. I'm calling this the capitalists at work, the railroad speculator, quite a notorious figure, Collis P. Huntington in his office at the Mills building. Uh, this picture taken from 1898. The point being that you can imagine these uh, gentlemen capitalists 
coming into work each day, passing through the Iron Gateway, which is, has its armed guards, going up into their office to do their work, not having to leave the building throughout the day, being able to take their meetings on the 10th floor, right? And then leaving when their work was done. While people like Huntington or Mills or Villard occupy the offices from the third to the ninth floor, the second floor of the building was occupied by large investment banks, including JW Seligman, that took an office on the first floor, while the ground floor at street level was taken by stockbrokers, right, that worked across from the New York Stock Exchange, including for example, the Henry Clues Company, who wrote one of the first um, sort of memoirs about life in Wall Street during the post-Civil War era. Uh, the Mills Building became so prominent in the sort of social life of Wall Street that he chose the, to illustrate the building that he was the occupant of uh, in the first edition of his book, 28 Years in Wall Street. All of which is to say that by far the most important reason all of these capitalists and bankers and railroads wanted to get inside of this building and pay the enormous rents that it commanded was because of the building's location, right? You can see here in this map of Lower Manhattan from 1879 that the Mills building outlined in red was located across from the New York Stock Exchange on Broad Street. It was next door neighbors with the Drexel Morgan and Company building, the predecessors to JP Morgan, right? And then it's surrounded just by dozens and dozens of investment banks, of the offices of other stockbrokers. It is literally a minute's walk away to the sub treasury, a minute's walk away from the customs house, from the cotton exchange, Two years later, the New York Produce Exchange, a new New York Produce Exchange was built on Bowling Green, right? So you're at the center of the sort of storm of the American financial system. Just a few more points before I move into the discussion of the construction of this building. In the Henry Clues's book, and actually in, in many histories of Wall Street or the American financial industry, written in the late 19th, early 20th century. The Mills building is usually taken as the beginning of what's often called the reconstruction of the financial district, meaning it was one of the first modern office buildings um, that began to replace these much older buildings, as you can see here on the photograph to the right, these old four, five, sometimes six story office buildings uh, which were perfectly serviceable in the 1850s, in the 1860s, and even in the 1870s. But which after, which after the construction of buildings like the Mills Building, right, one by one sort of met their fate with the wrecking ball. This is just a final photograph uh, that I wanted to share of the Mills Building as it was draped for the funeral march of President Ulysses S. Grant in the summer of 1885. Uh, as I may have mentioned before, we have very few photographs of the Mills building because it was torn down in 1825. And this is an excellent shot of the building with the gateway raised. And you can see this enormous monumental staircase that would take you up to the second floor in those investment banks as well as to the bank of seven elevators into the building proper. So as I hope I've been able to show, the Mills Building was a kind of landmark uh, in the history of Wall Street and of the American financial industry more broadly. It was also an important milestone in the history of the New York building industry. Uh, and at the history of in, within the history of the New York skyscraper, looking at the building in purely aesthetic terms, it was part of a shift in the 1880s away 
from the Victorian Second Empire style uh, that was popular in the 1870s, in which tall buildings featured mansard roofs and campanile towers. It was part of a shift toward the conception of the tall office building as essentially a big box, a tall big box. In structural terms, the Mills building uh, was built as a hybrid structure with load bearing, bearing masonry piers acting in conjunction with a very robust uh, iron frame built of wrought iron beams and cast iron columns acting together. Um, but what really attracted the attention of people in the building industry, particularly in the real estate industry of New York at the time, was the speed with which the Mills building was built. Um, construction started on the Mills building on May 1st, 1881, and the building was open to tenements the following year on May 1st, 1882. So why was speed important? Just for comparison, many of New York's first tall office buildings built almost a decade previously, excuse me, about seven, six to seven years before, right before the beginning of the depression of the 1870s, like the New York Tribune building, the Western Union building and the Evening Post building, all took about two years. I believe the Evening Post building also took about one and a half years, almost two years. The Morris Building, for example, which was started in 1878, one of the first tall office buildings in New York um, as the sort of negative economic consequences of the depression began to alleviate, uh, also took about two years to build. So excuse me for repeating myself, but uh, so why was speed important? Why was the community of real estate agents and owners, the, the sort of business interests of the building industry so impressed by this sort of one year, uh, one year construction time schedule? Why did Darius Ogden Mills put his architect, George B. Post, and his general contractor, his builder, David H. King, under the enormous pressure to sort of break this record. Well, I should have said, it wasn't right simply to break a record. Um, in, simple, in the simplest possible terms, uh, by building the building within a year, Darius Ogden Mill was able to start earning money uh, more quickly in order to make the building productive as soon as possible. Uh, that makes intuitive sense. Um, but the impetus to build quickly was even more sort of intense or more important uh, because of the location of the building uh, on Broad Street where the land values were very high. Um, I love this picture from 1875, looking out over Lower Manhattan. You can see the Drexel Morgan building there on the left. That's the corner of Broad Street in Wall Street. The site of the Mills building will be next door, those four or five story office buildings. You can actually see the New York Stock Exchange. That's the somewhat taller building across Broad Street. Um, if we go back and to think about the economics of the tall building itself, um, as Carol explains wonderfully in her book, Form Follows Finance, tall buildings were essentially built in response to high land values, right? which we reflected the desire of people uh, to pay more for space at particular locations. Well, the high, land, the high value of land in Lower Manhattan, particularly in a place like Broad Street also had implications, uh, excuse me, also uh, created incentives to build quickly. This is a drawing of the component lots of the Mills building site. In other words, these are all of the lots that Darius Ogden Mills sort of cobbled together in the spring of 1881 in order to create a site for his building. Now you have to remember that by 
purchasing all of these lots, which he paid over a million dollars for, an enormous amount of money at the time, would effectively put all of this land out of commission for as long as it took uh, to build the building. We don't actually have the financial figures of what all of these lots collectively earned, but it was likely a lot of money. So in the process of building this building, he's not only putting these lots out of commission, right? But he's also losing the income that he could get, have gained simply by buying these lots without building anything at all. I also wanted to share this bit of uh, information here. As I mentioned, he paid slightly over a million dollars for the land. And we know that the building itself, exclusive, exclusive of the land, also costs about the same amount of money, uh, which is very interesting because it shows that for Darius Oakden Mills, um, he was operating in a sense in a conservative mindset in which he's building this office building, not in order to force this land to have a higher value than it does, but in order to create a building that would yield, right? the maximum amount of value that the land itself, um, that he, the maximum amount of value that the land that he had paid for, excuse me, getting this, so that they would equal one another in proportion. Another important factor that was sh shaping this sort of demand for speed in the Mills Building Project uh, was the tradition of moving day. I mentioned earlier that the building was started on May 1st and it was completed on May 1st. May 1st was traditionally in New York, going back to colonial New York, uh, the day in which leases um, came due across the city uh, among virtually every type of commercial property. This is a wonderful painting from the 1820s of, of the sort of chaos of moving day. Uh, in antebellum New York, it was still quite chaotic up until the um, First World War. Now, because of the tradition of moving day and the fact that leases were renewed or started on May 1st, you can see in this uh, chart I've put together using the New York building statistics um, that there was a noticeable jump in this really the early to late spring of building permits filed in New York. This is another way to show that building owners typically were making their decisions about whether to build uh, in a pretty short amount of time, especially compared to today. Uh, by all accounts, Darius Ogden Mills started thinking about building a building uh, in the late winter of 1881, around January or February, assembled all of that land in um, March and April and started construction on May 1st. So how did this design team, so to speak, of George B. Post and David H. King uh, achieve this, uh, this sort of record-breaking um, milestone of building the building within a year? In fact, beginning, uh, excuse me, the second week of May of 1881, Darius Oakson Mills actually took his family uh, back to San Francisco where he still uh, owned a mansion and essentially left the project in the hands of his architect and of his general contractor. I would be remiss if did not say a little bit about George B. Post here. George B. Post at the time was really one of the most knowledgeable architects, not just in New York, but in the United States about the sort of unique design challenges of tall office buildings. Uh, in 1868, he was a consultant on the Equitable Life Building, sometimes viewed as one of the first tall buildings or certainly uh, a predecessor to the tall building. On the Equitable Life Project, he helped to redesign the ironwork and saved Henry B. Hyde and the life insurance company a considerable amount of money um, in his redesign of the ironwork. 
which then recommended him uh, to be the principal designer of the Western Union Building, which was completed in 1875. And actually, the year before, um, excuse me, while the uh, Mills Building was started, starting up in the late spring of 1881, excuse me, George B. Post finished work on the Post Building in Lower Manhattan, uh, which was actually built on land owned by the Post family, an old merchant family, uh, which actually featured that sort of central light court that became such a prominent um, element of the Mills Building. So we have a very experienced architect as a part of the design team. I would argue that when we are talking about the history of the tall building, as important as the architect is, uh, it's the builder or the general contractor uh, who's perhaps equally, if not more important, particularly within the business of construction, within the, the, within the sort of overall financial scheme of building. David H. King, like George B. Post, was a, a native New Yorker. He was born in 1849 to actually a wealthy family of property owners, the Kings, um, actually somewhat notorious. His father was a, in a sense, a slumlord on the Lower East Side. Um, if you look through old New York newspapers, you see stories about David H. King Jr.'s accomplishments alongside stories about David H. King Sr.'s um, sort of negligence and malfeasance in managing his tenements on the Lower East Side. Uh, nevertheless, David H. King uh, became a very prominent builder in New York in the 1880s. Uh, his principal trade was, a, was as a mason. So he was a mason builder and like many mason builders, sort of graduated into working as a general contractor in the sense that he was in charge of sort of supervising the entire construction project from start to finish. And I would actually wanna argue that there were three main improvements that David H. King Jr. Um, initiated on the Mills Building Project uh, that proved critical to achieving this um, uh, in order to meet the sort of need to build this building within a single year. Now, I would say that the most important sort of change that King um, introduced and that general contractors like King introduced was the way in which he reconceptualized the construction of buildings into a single production process. What I mean by that can be explained by a quote um, from the San Francisco Chronicle from 1882, in which they sent a journalist to New York City uh, in order to write about these new tall buildings that were being built. And this journalist actually visited the construction site of the Mills Building. And he noted, quote, in the construction said, shed located on site, are clerks and books and charts and diagrams, all especially provided with regular printed forms, such as one sees in the headquarters of a railroad undergoing construction. So we don't actually have these charts that David H. King used to construct the Mills Building. And the point is not that the charts themselves are important. The interesting thing to me is the implication that King was borrowing techniques first developed to construct the railroad uh, in order to build an office building more efficiently. As an example, I pulled this chart uh, from the Railroad Gazette from 1887, which is a progress diagram of uh, showing the construction of the St. Louis and San Francisco Railroad, one of the railroads that was actually headquartered in the Mills Building. You can see actually in this chart, it's diagramming the entire line, different sections of which are under the responsibility of different contractors. Uh, the black indicates the amount of tract laid and the sort of white bar, which the black bar is filling in, is sort of the desired length 
of the track, right, within each section. So we're talking about skyscrapers here, not railroads, but you can see how the railroad engineers are trying to find ways to graphically visualize and thus organize a very complicated construction process with multiple inputs taking place across hundreds of miles, theoretically using this on the small building site downtown, be much easier. So someone like King is reconceptualizing the building process as sort of a single operation, right? From above using his charts and his timekeepers. A second major um, sort of change or second innovation, let's say, that King introduced uh, according to a, a contracting journal was in fact the sidewalk shed. This is a diagram of what was called the sidewalk protection during building construction, um, which appeared in a building journal from 1890, which mentioned that this was the first, the Mills building, uh, was the first building project in New York to use the sidewalk shed. Sidewalk shed. Now, why would that be important? Part of the problem of organizing the construction process at the Mills building or at similar projects was simply organizing the flow of materials to the site. By law, you could not just store building materials on the sidewalk in New York or in the street. Using this sidewalk shed, which is now the bane of New Yorkers existence, the idea was that you could bring in deliveries of material and put it up on top of the platform, essentially as a staging platform for this sort of semi-industrial building operation that's going on on site while also protecting pedestrians, of course. So the third innovation links very closely to the first two. Um, we do not have photographs or drawings of the Mills building being uh, worked on at night, but we do know that it was one of the very first building projects in New York that had night work, in which work was done at night. Now, construction was not carried on at night in the Mills building, but what would happen is that all of those materials uh, needed to build the building, instead of being brought through the streets during the day when traffic was at its worst, right? All of those materials, the brick, the iron, all of it would be brought to the site at night and staged on that platform on the sidewalk shed before the beginning of work each day. At the same time, all of the debris all of the trash that was produced by the day's work uh, would be ejected from the site and carted away uh, by another sort of team of cartmen. So we have a builder that's reconceptualizing construction using railroad building techniques, a builder who is starting to rethink the construction site itself as a sort of problem of organization Right, and someone who's also pushing construction into the night, or at least the preparation of construction into the into nighttime. Right, you start to see um, how construction is being rationalized by the general contractor. Now, only second in importance to David H. King Jr. Uh, were all of the subcontractors that worked on the building. I believe I mentioned earlier that David H. King Jr. was a mason builder. So he brought in the bricklayers and the stone masons and also served as the general contractor, meaning he supervised the work of about a, two dozen other uh, subcontractors who within their own line of work were equally as prominent as George B. Post or King. For example, John B. Cornell, the owner of the uh, of New York's major, one of its major ironwork, architectural ironworks, uh, Charles R. Otis, a partner in the Otis Brother Elevator Company. In fact, Thomas Edison worked as a subcontractor on the Mills Building, which is somewhat unusual because he obviously did not identify with the building industry and uh, later went on to bigger and better things. Alfred Hall was the one of the founders of the terracotta industry of New Jersey, 
Thomas J. Byrne, shown in the lower left, uh, was a prominent plumber in New York City. John D. Crimmins, second from the bottom left, was a very, actually one of the wealthiest contractors in New York uh, who specialized in excavation work for private and more importantly for public projects. Uh, Viner Jones Hedden was the owner of an, a prominent carpentry firm in Newark. And then Henry A. Maurer um, owned a factory in New Jersey near Perth Amboy uh, that created fire brick or hollow terracotta tiles to use in the creation of floors and walls to fireproof these modern office buildings. Now, John Black Cornell is sort of a representative contractor. Um, as you can see, he was about two decades older. Many of these contractors, apart from Edison, were older than Post or King. Um, John Black Cornell owned JB and JM Cornell Ironworks, uh, which at the time employed about a thousand people and was the largest architectural ironworks in the United States. Like many of these other businesses uh, that contributed to the production of the Mills Building, in spite of the fact that Cornell Ironworks was, a, was an enormous sort of contractor within the New York building world, it was very much a local firm. It was a um, propri proprietary firm, meaning that J.B. Cornell and his brother, J.M. Cornell, owned and operated the firm themselves. And obviously, it was also a family firm. This is an image from an atlas of New York showing the Cornell Ironworks occupying essentially an entire block on the west side at 11th Avenue and 26th Street uh, with their own rail spur from the New York Central coming down 11th Avenue. Otis Brothers and Company which was the, the contractor that provided the elevators uh, and had its location in Yonkers, was another prominent local business that contributed to the Mills building. These are some images from the cover of Scientific American from 1881. Like the Cornell Ironworks, the Otis Brothers and Company needed you know, a substantial amount of land, which is one of the reasons it was located in Yonkers, uh, right by the Hudson River and the necessary rail lines, actually also the New York Central. This is a photograph of the Edison Machine Works, which was located in uh, Manhattan, uh, right below the the future site of the Williamsburg Bridge on Gorick Street. You can see the location of Edison Machine Works here. So those were large sort of businesses, um, manufacturers really of machinery and equipment and basic building materials like uh, wrought iron and cast iron structural elements. Uh, the Mills Building also utilized the um, services and crafts of someone like Thomas J. Byrne, uh, who was one of the who owned one of the largest plumbing shops in New York City, located on Fourth Avenue, uh, near the present site of Grand Central Terminal. This is a drawing of some of his handiwork or the handiwork of his firm in the basement of the Mills Building. And then finally, just to just, just sort of looking out over the landscape of these different firms, this is a photograph of the uh, Alfred Hall Terracotta Company Factory Number no. One, uh, which was the first terracotta factory established in the New Jersey Clay District uh, in uh, Perth Amboy, New Jersey, on the other side of Staten Island. So this, the Perth Amboy Clay District, this became the sort of home of the Northeastern terracotta industry. This is where all of that wonderful terracotta ornament 
that was used on the Mills Building and on many buildings in New York up until the Great Depression was produced. What's important to me, what's interesting to me about all these firms is that you can see that they were all located, virtually all of them, within the um, greater metropolitan area of New York City. I just picked sort of a handful of the firms to show you where they were located. You can see the Mills Building in Lower Manhattan, the Perth Amboy, the Alfred A. Hall Company became the Perth Amboy Terracotta Company in New Jersey. Uh, New York became a very favored location for woodworking mills. You can see the Otis Elevator Company located in Yonkers. A lot of the sand used in the construction of virtually all buildings in New York City uh, came from Port Washington, Long Island. Meanwhile, you see some of the core uh, subcontractors, the ones that required highly skilled labor that needed for economic reasons to be close to the building site itself. The Cornell Ironworks or the TJ Byrne Plumbing Shop are located on Manhattan Island itself. Uh, as was the Edison machine shop, as I mentioned, although it moved to Schenectady in 1886, uh, after which it grew into General Electric. Now, while all of these, most of these subcontractors are located in the greater New York area, they are also using other suppliers, right, that are feeding the New York building industry uh, from this larger regional market or even a national market, right? So someone like David H. King is buying brick from the Haverstraw brick yards about 30 or 40 miles up the Hudson River. This is also where the iron ore is coming from down the Hudson River. Um, cities like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh have their own manufacturers of glass or front brick that's coming into the New York building market. A lot of the granite and lime is coming from New England or Newfoundland. Increasingly in the late 19th century, the hardwoods used in New York construction were coming from the American South, right? While at the same time, a lot of rare woods as well as asphaltum are coming from Mexico or South America. So we have this sort of craft economy located on Manhattan, in Manhattan, in the greater New York area right, existing within this sort of larger industrial landscape, right, and it's sort of interlocking at these different scales. All of the sort of productive capacity of these firms at these different scales is being activated in order to build that single building, the Mills building. And in conclusion, that's sort of the point I want to emphasize um, is that a building like the Mills building um, was impressive because it represented the kind of collective capacity, productive capacity of the New York building industry or the building industry at a particular moment in time, right? Drawing upon not just the um, sort of experience and expertise of the architect and the general contractor and the important innovations that they are starting to introduce to remold the construction process to rationalize it, but it's also drawing upon this, this sort of wider landscape of firms located in Manhattan, uh, located throughout the greater New York area, and also within a larger regional or national context, right? All of these firms sort of working together to build this one building on a particular site within a particular moment of time and to create it within this very hectic and very chaotic urban environment. And by building it efficiently within a year, showing that these tall office buildings are not just uh, experiments, right? They're not necessarily even risky investments. They were able by building the building within a year to show that they in fact could be very productive um, in very safe, in a sense, financial risks. And in the early 1880s, a lot of Darius Ogden Mills friends took note of that fact 
For example, Cyrus W. Field, who like Darius Ogden Mills, had no background in real estate and no particular interest uh, in construction, built his own Mills building, so to speak, when he financed the Washington building on Bowling Green, overlooking the New York Harbor. Orlando B. Potter, who is another sort of wealthy New Yorker, I don't believe he worked in finance. I think he had a kind of background in real estate and in politics. In 1883, he started to develop the so-called Potter Building. You can see the New York Tribune Building just in the background there in the Old Times Building. Okay, um, but at the, so while the successful completion of a project like the Mills Building um, really sort of fired the imagination of these big capitalists to start investing in downtown real estate in a big way. And while it certainly helped to revitalize the building industry as a whole, not a single building, but the construction of a growing number of these large, expensive modern buildings in the 1880s certainly revitalized the building industry. Uh, it also began to revitalize the building trades as well. In fact, as the Mills Building was being built, uh, the modern New York labor movement was actually coming back into its own after being dormant for about a decade due to the depression of the 1870s. In January of 1882, for example, uh, there was a great mass meeting held at the Cooper Union. Uh, it was part of a demonstration for the Land League, uh, which was an organization founded uh, to advocate for Irish independence. So there were other things going on at the same time, other than economic growth that is sort of revitalizing the modern labor movement. But I just want to end with this slide here. Uh, this is an image of the uh, first Labor Day parade in New York in the fall of 1882, the grand demonstration of working men. So this was held a few months uh, after the completion of the Mills Building, um, which is sort of showing the, the, the sort of confidence and growing pride of the New York labor movement. Uh, I just want to conclude by, by sort of pointing out that the same demand for speed in a project like the Mills Building, uh, that demand for speed, which, which really obsessed and pushed to the limit the capabilities of all these building firms in order to maximize the, the, the value of that land on Broad Street. Um, first of all, it provided an enorm enormous stimulus for enormous demand for skilled labor in the construction industry. Um, but more specifically, that demand for speed uh, gave the building trades throughout the 1880s uh, an incredible leverage uh, within their own struggles against builders and other building employers um, to shorten the working day, to raise wages, uh, by in a sense using that demand against the building owners in order to go on strike and hold up these enormous building projects uh, which more often than not uh, would force builders and building owners um, to accede to their demands. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Alex, as we come on. Thank you, that, uh, that was a terrific compilation of images to paint a picture of New York in the 1880s um, and a kind of constellation and cast of characters that you that you really brought in order to um, vividly represent the the um, situation on Broad Street in the, in the financial district and that has raised some questions for me that I hope you'll be able to answer um, about the, the building and its use and its its tenants because um, 
I've loved at the way that you set us up at the beginning by showing the different levels of, of the building and you know how it would enter and what the first and second floor would be used. And I did not know about the the restaurant for the uh, for the railroad tycoons and the the various um, uh, high level capitalists that would be able to you know stay in their city within a city. That so my question is um, that painted a picture of of an extremely exclusive uh, kind of businessmen's club and and kind of inner inner circles of capitalists uh, that resided in the building but I've also read somewhere that uh, what seems to be an astonishing figure uh, for us today I, and I know this kind of goes cuts across the late 19th century that there were I think 11,000 people that occupied the building the mills building every day. So between tenants and those who visited it for business or the you know, telegram boys that would, uh, would, would deliver messages in order to keep the lifeblood of that, of that building operating. Um, it, is, that, is that a correct number? And that speaks to the masses rather than the exclusivity, um, as you were suggesting with the security guards and you know, making sure that, um, that the wrong people weren't admitted. So could you talk a little bit more about that kind of social context of, of the building? Yes, Carol. Um, I have seen that figure as well. I wonder if that, did, did you say 10,000? I saw 11,000. Yeah. 11, so, wow, I, for a 10-story building. I wonder if that was the number of people that entered the building each day. Um, I have seen that figure as well. Um, the buildings like the Mills Building, as I know Carol knows, it, in earlier buildings like the Western Union, uh, the New York Tribune Building, they were often described as cities within cities. And that's a sort of expression that you see throughout um, New York skyscraper history, like with the Woolworth Building. People were totally astonished at the number of people that could inhabit these buildings, which more people inhabited these buildings or used them in a day than you know, lived in many, most towns in the United States. Um, so I, I, Carol, that is a great point. A lot of what I've found about the Mills Building suggests its exclusivity. Um, and you, you try to read between the lines. Sometimes buildings are being advertised. Uh, someone like Henry Clues, uh, it, he talks about the Mills Building, but it's all wrapped up in his own sort of life story. Um, so that, that's an interesting point. Um, it was a public space to some degree, but an exclusive public space. Um, this world of the gentlemanly capitalist who are often quite ruthless, but thought of themselves as gentlemanly capitalists. I see the building as being a product of that world. And those are the types of people that rented offices in the Mills building. Um, but to some degree, it must have been open to a broader public that wanted these financial services that interacted with these different types of financial agents. And what about the um, place of women in, in these buildings? Is the eighth, early 1880s too soon to see uh, female workers uh, or in, in any role, uh, certainly not as, as clerks, but uh, one, I, I, I know then the probably late 1880s, early 1890s in the insurance industry, you began to get a kind of hierarchy of stenographers um, versus their male overseers. But uh, uh, what is, is there a, lady, a lady's toilet floor uh, in the floor plans for the Mills building? And how, how complete is the architectural uh, record in terms of blueprints or any of any other kind of logs from the post office about the Mills building? That's a great question. We have very little documentation of the Mills building. It's hard to find good photographs. We do not have a complete set of plans that I have ever seen, like the original blueprints. Um, you can find plans in different publications. Um, Often uh, a women's restroom would sort of all, there would be a men's restroom on every floor of these office buildings. And then a one, like one women's restroom on one floor. Later they were alternated until finally there was both on each floor. 
I don't have enough building plans to know. Um, the plans that I have only show men's restroom, um, which, which doesn't mean that there were only men's restrooms. Um, there are references to scrub women, to maintenance workers that were called scrub women that worked that in the, at night would clean and take care of the building. Um, my impression is that, th that this was very much a, a, a man's domain, the mills building. Um, individually, I'm, it's a good, I feel like that's a great question. If women were working in different capacities in these offices, I just couldn't say. You did mention when we were chatting earlier before we began that there were uh, ledgers from George B. Post's firm um, that survive in the New York Historical Society. What, what kind of documentation that maybe people haven't explored um, yet that have, have you been discovering that seemed to enrich the story? Well, with, with, at the New York Historical Society, where, where I'm beaming into everyone tonight, they have wonderful architectural collections made up of drawings, for example, from George B. Post's firm, from McKim, Eaton White, et cetera. Uh, and those drawings are, are, are beautiful. If we had them of the Mills building, I would have shown everyone, because I'm Post's other drawings are extraordinary works of art. Um, uh, but we don't have those. What we do have is financial records, which, uh, architectural historians have looked at the records of firms, not to the degree I think they could. The George B. Post records show uh, the number of employees that he is working with at any one time. During the construction of the Mills building, he had about 12 employees, which today would be, that would be a pretty small firm. Um, it also shows his income, the cost of running an office, uh, and his own profits. Um, George B. Post was born to a wealthy merchant family. He would have been wealthy even if he didn't practice architecture. Uh, but those records show that uh, specializing in office buildings uh, actually produced an income of about forty or fifty thousand dollars a year for Post uh, of, of personal profit after all expenses, um, and that would have been um, a salary, for example. Uh, for one of the most successful lawyers in New York at the time, $50,000 would have been, was an enormous amount of money in the 1880s. Wasn't his, wasn't his um, office in the Equitable Building? It was in the Equitable Building, and then he moved it to an office overlooking Union Square. It's the current location of the Barnes & Noble in Union Square. Um, it was the Century you know, Building, wasn't it? I, I think that's right, Carol. Yes, in the 1880s. Hmm. Um, and speaking of money, you, you mentioned the, the um, fairly conservative approach that Mills brought to the investment land and, and building, uh, but you, you didn't um, reveal the revenue. Do, you, do we know what that was? What was he earning on his investment? Uh, excuse me, Carol. Um, this, this actually, there was a sort of debate about this because the manager of the Mills building was deposed in the later 1880s as a part of a trial, of course. totally unrelated to the Mills building as an expert witness, like you are the building manager of New York's greatest office building. And he couldn't be bullied into revealing it. But some sources suggest that it was at least a quarter of a million dollars a year for that first decade and could have been about 300,000. We don't have the full financial workups, but it suggests that the return was between 10 and 15%, which was in the early 1880s, that was great. That was yeah. incredible. Yeah. Um, so I, I, um, I think people don't generally realize people, I don't know who those people are, but one doesn't find that much in the academic literature within architectural history, uh, a, a discussion of, the, of buildings as, um, revenue producers, right? It's kind of the, the, um, the, an investment in land and, and building that produces a return. And this is the whole purpose, as you mentioned with, with Mills, of undertaking a project such as this is order to, to um, create a revenue stream, a reliable revenue stream 
that beats what you could make um, investing in railroad stocks, not in building a railroad, but investing and clipping coupons as, as it were, so, uh, or, or building tenements so that the return on investment um, uh, in, in stocks, I think, a four or five percent was considered a pretty pretty st um, standard and and admirable investment. So to, to make something like ten percent uh, is is really a uh, haul uh, in terms of you know of uh, um, something that's considered not a risk but a, a, a continuous revenue stream. Yes, um, just like today, we can imagine someone like Mills as immersed as he was within the world of finance, um, was comparing something like an office building to other ways to make money. There are, there are many reasons why someone would build an office building and name it for themselves, but earning the income long-term, I think was, was, was paramount. And as, as Carol was saying, uh, the stock market could earn a lot of things maybe four, five, 6%. Government bonds earned three or 4%. Those are much easier ways to make money just buying bonds. Building a building is a, um, as I pointed out, it was conservatively planned in the way, um, the proportion of the building costs and the land. Um, in other ways, that's a difficult way to make money. Um, there's a lot of trust that's involved so as Carol was saying, uh, these skyscraper builders in the 1880s wanted a higher return for that risk, so to speak. I'm going to make an effort to read some of the questions that have come in through the yes. chat. And one which seems um, relevant here is, uh, how many square feet did, did the Mills building have? Uh, that's quite 200, viable, right? 200,000 gross square feet, uh, maybe about 150,000 of rentable office space. Mm -hmm. uh, so we could take the 11,000 people and, and divide that if we were good at, math, good at math and see what seems reasonable. But I, I do know from, uh, from much literature of the skyscraper through the 1890s that there's, that there's an extraordinarily high population that is supposed to uh, have um, uh, occupied or frequented these buildings. And I believe the at the turn of the century, 15 Park Row had something like 15,000 uh, uh, tenants in it. It was a 30, 30 story building, but um, on a small footprint overall. Also, it was a time when we had porters and I mentioned all of these watchmen. Um, there were all of these engineers uh, that worked in the basement to keep the boilers running. There was a whole sort of workforce that kept maintain these buildings that obviously buildings still have, but I think there were many more of them in these older buildings. Uh, another question uh, posed about costs is, was, the, was it typical that the land cost would be 80% of the cost of an expensive building? Um, is that, isn't that high by today's standard? I, I'm, I'm not sure that evolved city and land land values is, is really that comparable but you um, you offered 50 percent of the of the cost or that the costs were equal of the land and and the building uh, improvement right um, so I'm not sure where the 80 where the questioners 80 percent came out but maybe you could just talk more generally um, about other examples that you've encountered in this period cost of land cost of building construction and building. Well, um, I recommend if anyone is interested in this particular, it's kind of a technical aspect, but it's a very revealing one to, so that you can learn what the intentions of a building owner uh, were. Um, for example, the Woolworth building um, was built, was much more expensive than the land that it was built on. I forget, I forget the ratio, but it was substantially more expensive. And in the real estate record and builder's guide, uh, the sort of official journal of the New York real estate industry. Um, there were a lot of reasons that building owners didn't like the build, Woolworth building because it was going to steal their tenants, but they, a lot of building owners were very concerned that this very rich guy, Woolworth, was sort of breaking the equation by building far in advance of the value of the land. Actually, the West, the 90 West Street building 
another Cass Gilbert project was also built ahead, so to speak, of the value of the land. And um, um, if I may interject there, uh, the West Street building, Cass Gilbert said in regard to that very building, a skyscraper is a machine that makes the land pay. Yes. Um, in fact, I need to personally digest more research uh, to understand exactly what is behind this proportion of the building and the land. Uh, but the, it should make basic sense. The building is supposed to sort of capitalize the value of the land and no more. If you're doing more than that, then you're sort of projecting ahead. Uh, I think that's called speculating though, <laughs> which is yes. kind of synonymous with skyscraper um, development. Uh, his, historically, speculation becomes um, a, a larger and larger proportion of the, build, the buildings created because it's no longer an owner building either for his own purposes or a company like the Tribune building a headquarters or Western Union building a headquarters and inserting additional floors of rental space in order to um, make the building overall more imposing and more valuable, but by creating a, a revenue stream. But to build a building as indeed the Woolworth building was, a speculative building with only one and a half floors of the 50 floors of, of the, the Woolworth building yes. um, devoted to the Woolworth company. That is um, definitely taking uh, you know, a, a flyer on the, on the future as it, as it were. Um, although the territory, the growth of New York in those years and the territory of downtown and City Hall Park, uh, which was certainly developing with with tall buildings, um, but would become you know, ever more dense and concentrated and, and vertical in, in those moments. It hardly, it hardly seems wildly visionary in order to, to think um, that, that that might be a spot to make that kind of statement. I absolutely agree, Carol. Um, like with the West Street Project, Cass Gilbert's Great Skyscraper, um, that was built sort of ahead of the value of the land and the other real estate agents were sort of questioning that. Uh, it was all based on the idea that land values were gonna rise on West Street after they had widened it in the early 20th century. And um, I'm sure in most cases in New York, the land values did catch up to the value of the building. I will say that that proportion, that sort of equation, I don't believe that holds any longer. I can't speak to why that is, but I believe now today, a tall, a, a big skyscraper in New York costs much, much more than the value of the land. Um, just to answer that question. So it changes over time. Um, some additional questions. Uh, dismantling and tearing down skyscrapers was as new as building skyscrapers. And so the demolition as well as uh, the construction. Um, new techniques were uh, where material were materials resold disposed of when the building was torn down you know i guess process uh, and more curi curiosity about process especially in these extremely um already densely developed areas like the financial district um it is of interest yes um so the buildings that the mills building replaced those were old dingy dark by comparison but those were well-built buildings and all across lower manhattan uh, a well-built old building would be dismantled by taking it apart piece by piece which in these older masonry structures was very possible um, it's just bricks and timber and plaster and those pieces would be recycled in fact the early demolition companies so to speak started out as secondhand building material dealers and they often bid on the um, contract to tear down buildings because they would resell the materials. Um, there's a little, I cannot remember her name, but there's some good research on the rise of a different type of demolition company in the early 20th century when uh, these companies were tasked with tearing down modern buildings. That was sort of a different business because you didn't need or even want to recycle parts of these new skyscrapers. You just wanted to tear them down as quickly as possible. And often these buildings were just junked 
Uh, so a company like the Jacob Volk company in the 20s specialized in basically high speed demolition. Uh, whereas a company like Frederick Segrist in the 1880s was a secondhand building material dealer. And a lot of those materials ended up in the tenements, I would just add a lot of those bricks, for example. And so the, um, the third of your three legs of your, your dissertation and discussion, and we, you ended with, with labor as, as an issue, someone would like to know, uh, was worker safety compromised um, with either speed of construction or could you talk a little bit more of, of the work site um, and the dangers that it posed or you know, what, the, what were the issues uh, of uh, tension and conflict? Mm. Well, I would say throughout history, construction is an inherently dangerous occupation to be engaged in. Um, I would say intuitively and based on the historical record, there was the perception that building was becoming more dangerous. You can, you can die by falling off a five-story building, obviously, um, but as buildings get taller, um, a lot of sort of new dangers are introduced as trades are sort of staggered into the building at the same time, uh, the dangers of just materials falling down on your head, working on a lower story, the dangers of falling. Um, I would say by the 1920s, the sort of obsession with speed in the New York construction industry produces a kind of crisis that the building industry has to tackle. Uh, there's this enormous sort of speed up in the 1920s to build all these big office buildings. I haven't found anything that suggests that speed in the, in the 1880s was responsible for injuries, um, but there was a greater emphasis on safety laws, either because building was becoming more dangerous or because the labor, the building trades unions were becoming stronger. They effectuated the passage of the first scaffolding law in the mid 1880s, uh, which enabled the state to not just uh, fine a contractor for unsafe scaffolding or ladders, but to charge them with a misdemeanor, for example. Um, so we would like to establish like some causality here. And I feel like there is, but you know, it, it's, it's a bit impressionistic, I would say. Um, and as we have about 10 minutes maximum um, left for discussion. Um, let me um, press you on one, one point about the general contractor and whether King uh, should really be called that. Uh, in general, the kind of narrative of the development of the gen general contractor is George A. Fuller in Chicago, who then standardizes many of the uh, aspects of production, makes them incredibly more efficient. Uh, in kind of in, in um, parallel with advances in steel skeleton construction and then the production of better steels and delivery to the site so that the necessity of uh, efficiency and the possibility of, of efficiency really becomes perfected from the 1890s and then forward and certainly um, with the uh, paramount example being the Empire State Building, uh, equivalent of 102 stories built in just 11 or 13 months, depending on how you want to count um, either side of that year of construction. So uh, that, you know, the incredible speed of construction that was accomplished through the industrialization of materials and on a very large work site is generally attributed uh, to, I know Don and I, you know, have worked on building the Empire State with, with yeah. from the Starrett's um, own description of the organization of, of the work. Um, and, and, and that was um, building buildings the way uh, you ran trains out of Grand Central or that you brought an army of men onto the site and, or, and organized the work site. So did, did King have that kind of attention to detail and you know, pro professional um, calibration that, that we usually associate with Fuller and the, the skyscraper builders who came after him. To put it simply, yes, I, th I think that he did. Um, 
Carol's bringing up a great sort of historiographical question, a real mystery about the sort of development or rise of the general contractor, who is clearly a key figure within the development of the tall office building. Um, I should have mentioned that some, an architect like George Post was fully capable of supervising the construction of a tall building. Um, and it seems that he became very, if not friends, a sort of close professional collaborator with David H. King. Uh, the question is, could someone like George B. Post effectively supervise the construction of a building within the year? And could he do it for multiple building projects, which he had going on at the same time? And I think the answer was that he couldn't, which is why someone like King was so essential. Um, we do not have the project records of the Mills building, which would answer this question definitively. We're sort of piece, I'm piecing together parts of the puzzle. And it's only because I think the Mills building is particularly important that I even tried to do this. And I think the reference to the railroad construction and the shed on the site, there are other references to all of the timekeepers that David H. King employed. Um, all of these references to, to a sort of modernized general contracting operation, it, it doesn't seem like it was the Starrett Company or Thompson Starrett or Fuller, um, but it seems similar the way that he's described. The, and why he sort of disappears from the historical record compared to Fuller, I'm, I'm not really sure why that is. I guess because he didn't work in steel, he was still, this was still an iron building. That seems like a superficial reason to me, but we know that the narrative of steel sort of kind of dominated research on skyscrapers until a few decades ago. So in our last um, few minutes, and since this is the, the, the last of the um, previously scheduled of the, the five explorations of, of building in New York and, and Chicago. Um, do you, um, you know, please tell us your thoughts about, about the earlier sessions and some of the questions that you would like to raise as we look forward to, you know, revisiting in a, in a, um, a dialogue uh, that will be preceded, I'm, I'm sure, by a lot of discussion amongst us uh, about what are, what are those questions, what are, where should we turn our attention next? But what occurs to you in this comparative uh, model? I, I know that earlier we were talking about a kind of urban perspective or um, even eco kind of urban ecological perspective about uh, which you mapped for us in, in terms of the different kinds of industries that you could see uh, that were, were you know, um, contributing to um, just the Mills building, but, you know, but really the building of, of New York. Um, maybe you could repeat sure. those those first thoughts um, that um, that we you know previewed earlier. Um, yes, for, for those, I, I hope that most of you also joined for uh, Thomas Leslie and Donald Friedman's earlier discussions uh, about frames and foundations and facades and fire. Um, I feel like one common theme from those lectures and, and definitely interests me in my own work is what is something that Don Friedman described as um, the industrialization of building or industrialized building. Um, now these skyscrapers are not the only buildings built in the United States, obviously. I think one of the reasons that we are continually drawn to them is because they sort of represent the latest in building technology, right? The time demands, the sort of economic constraints in them are very unique. And, and often very intense and sort of, so you can kind of see the advancement of the building industry project by project. What, in, what I think would be interesting to think about is to look at the relationship of the development of tall buildings in the context of this building industry or the, the, sort, of, the sort of urban, the urban economic context of the building industry. Um, my impression is that the building of skyscrapers, even though they only represented a pretty small part of all the buildings built each year, that they had an enormous role in stimulating technological improvement, in stimulating sort of capital accumulation in all of these different industries like the elevator industry and the iron industry. 
Um, what I, you know, I don't know if that's really been mapped out and that, I don't know if that seems like an overly technical interest, but it's sort of putting the construction of skyscrapers back into the urban environment that they were obviously very much a part of. Um, that, that interests me a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what about the um, comparison or contrast of building cultures in New York versus Chicago? Do you see New York as uh, exceptional or a leader or, um, or you know, a follower as the general narrative of Chicago invents the skeleton and then um, New, York, New York adopts it? I view New York as the leader. I, New York, I view New York as the sort of most advanced center of building in the United States. It has the biggest building industry. It has the most capital sort of flooding into the building industry, which is not to say that I think its architects or its builders are better or smarter or more inventive. I think that given the economic importance of New York City, um, that in a sense, it's logical for, in, in the fact that it's older, it's a much older city, the building industry is older, that it would have a more mature building industry uh, than Chicago. That said, I was telling Carol before we started this talk that I think there is a synergy between the two cities. And although I believe New York was the leader, um, I prefer to, to sort of put aside the civic rivalry and to sort of look at the this, this synergetic relationship between the United States, two principal cities in this period, which were really very much unlike any other city in the United States, um, our first two truly modern cities. Um, so I hope that doesn't anger anyone in Chicago. But well, it's, it seems appropriate as a, a kind of as a closing thought, but uh, as a provocation for further discussion. Um, uh, you know, a partisan commitment to New York, which uh, of course I, I share. I have to uh, you know admit my prejudice, uh, but uh, but also a kind of conciliatory gesture towards uh, a conversation about trying to find common ground uh, that that makes sense in an overarching narrative um, of how, how cities grew in the 19th century and then how they grew, grew vertically um, in the 20th and, and still today. So um, it does seem like a, a good door open to, uh, to another chapter. And I'm gonna invite everybody to, to come back in June as we'll um, inform you of, of how we are going to uh, you know, digest um, our thoughts and then, um, and then try to pose some additional questions and, and topics for the future and that we invite you all to, to pose your questions um, to the museum. You can, you can certainly um, email them to us at uh, programs at skyscraper.org. Uh, so you'll, you'll find a place on our, info, on our website or info at skyscraper.org. Any of those will, uh, will get to us uh, and to make suggestions about how we can expand this series and um, thank uh, certainly Alexander Wood for tonight, but as well especially Tom Leslie and, and Don Friedman, who will join us again, and, and Joanna Merwood Salisbury and Brian Bowen and Jared Green, who all brought their expertise uh, to this discussion. And there's a lot more to be said. So um, Alex, we'll, we'll see you next time on, on, uh, on these topics. And thank you so much for tonight for um, really fleshing out the picture of, the, of a building, a very important building in the financial district uh, that, um, that too few of us know much about. Um, and we hope you'll find more in your research um, and is your, in your book and we'll be, all be able to read it and see it uh, very soon. So thanks for joining us for tonight and for the whole series and everybody, thank you um, for being with us for these five parts um, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Bye.